Welcome to this video lecture on two-factor experiments. A two-factor experiment, as the name suggests, investigates the effect of two factors on a response. In this first simple example, we will investigate the effect on fuel economy of the two factors driver and vehicle. We represent the drivers in the rows of the table. So the rows represent factor one, and we represent the vehicle in the columns of the table. So the columns represent factor two. And then every cell in the table represents a combination of a certain driver with a certain vehicle. We call this a crossed design because every combination occurs. All the rows cross all of the columns. And the combination of a certain driver with a certain vehicle we call a factor level combination. It's a phrase that we will use as time goes on. Now in this experiment there's only a single observation in every cell so this experiment is actually quite limited and in future we will always have replication in the cells but we begin with this simple example. We can represent the data in a table for the software by using a column for every variable and a row for every case. So even though we used rows and columns in a table in the previous slide, that's just for our own convenience in order to display the data in a way that's easy for us to view. The software always requires the data to be represented with a column for every variable and a row for every case. The ANOVA table has the familiar headings but has two p-values, one p-value for each factor. So we can interpret the p-values individually. The p-value for a vehicle is less than 5%. So we reject the null hypothesis that vehicle has no effect on fuel economy in favour of the alternative. Vehicle does have an effect on fuel economy. In fact, SUVs tend to use more fuel. The p-value for driver is greater than 5%, so we accept the null hypothesis that driver has no effect on fuel economy. This experiment has not proven that driver has an effect on fuel economy. We now move on to a two-factor experiment where we also include replication in the cells. So this is a full two-factor experiment. This experiment explores the effect on reading time, which is the response, of the two factors language and person. So the experiment consists of different people reading a page from a novel and the novels are in different languages. We have two levels of language, English and Spanish, represented by the rows of the table and we have three levels of person, Samuel, Alice and Manuel, represented by the columns on the table and we have replication in the cells because each person read more than once in each language. Now <clears throat> we can look at the numbers in the table and get some idea about what's happening in this process. And then someone might ask us what they think is a simple question. They might ask the question, who takes longer to read? And they're expecting a simple answer to that question. But if you look at the data in the table, you realise that the answer to that question is not simple. The answer to that question begins with, it depends on the language. So the effect of the person depends on the language. So we see that in a two-factor experiment it can happen that not only would factor one have an effect on the response or factor two might have an effect on the response but factor one and factor two in combination could have an effect on the response. We notice in the table for example that Manuel reading in Spanish is surprisingly fast. We call this feature interaction. Interaction means the effect of one factor depends on the level of some other factor. So we cannot give a simple answer to the question, who takes longer to read? It depends on whether we're talking about reading in English or reading in Spanish. Another way to describe this is to say that the effect of the combination of factor levels is not the same as what you would expect to get by adding the effects of the factors on their own. So if you look at how much longer it takes to read in Spanish and how much longer it takes for Manuel to read, those two pieces of information don't tell you how much longer it takes Manuel to read in Spanish. 
because the combination of Manuel and Spanish is surprising in light of the effect of Manuel and Spanish on their own. So in a two-factor experiment, there are actually three things to think about. The effect of factor one by itself, the effect of factor two by itself, and interaction, which is the effect of factor one and factor two in combination. Another example of this could be something like an allergic reaction. If you combine people with foods, even a healthy person combined with a wholesome food can give rise to an unexpected response because that combination gives rise to an unusual outcome. So the model for a two-factor experiment takes this into account. In general, we say, why is the response in a two-factor experiment? And y equals mu, which is the grand average response. So if we're thinking about numbers in a table, that's the grand average of all the numbers in the table, averaged over all the rows and columns. Plus alpha is the row effect. It's the effect of factor one. How much does the average in a particular row exceed the grand average? How much does the average response when factor one is set at a particular level exceed the grand average? Likewise, beta is the column effect. How much does the average in a particular column exceed the grand average? How much does the uh, level, a particular level of factor two exceed the grand average? And then we have eta, the interaction effect. How much does a cell average exceed the average you would expect to find in that cell? Because if the row and column effects were added together, you would expect that the average in a cell would be mu, the grand average for the table, plus alpha, the effect based on that row, plus beta, the effect of that column. But that might not be the average in the cell. There might be an unusual average in the cell. And so it is how much greater is the average in the cell compared to what's expected. And finally, epsilon is the error. So an individual entry in a cell, an individual observation, may be higher or lower than the cell average. And epsilon measures how much higher is an individual observation compared to the average that arises in that cell. So we say all of these things again in relation to our reading experiment by way of an example. So here is the model for the response in our reading experiment, y being the time required to read a page from the novel. Mu is the grand average reading time averaged over all the languages and persons. So mu is What's the average time required to read a page from a novel? Averaged over all of the persons and all of the languages. Alpha then is the language main effect. How much more time on average is required to read a page in that language compared to the grand average? The effect of the language. How much longer is the reading time because of the particular language that's being used? Beta is the person main effect. How much more time on average is required by that person to read a page compared to the grand average? So the person main effect. And then eta is the interaction effect. How much more time on average is required for that particular language person combination compared to what would be expected? So how much greater is the average reading time for a certain person reading in a certain language compared to what you would expect the average to be. And finally, epsilon is the error. How much more time was taken on a single occasion compared to the average time for that language person combination. So how much more time was taken on that occasion compared to the average time taken when that person reads a page in that language. So there are three null hypotheses to be tested. The first null hypothesis says there is no interaction effect. All the etas are zero. There are no unusual cells in the table. Or in our experiment, this would mean there is no language person interaction. There is no unusual reading time that arises with any particular combination of person and language. There is no interaction in the experiment is the first null hypothesis that we test. And we must test it first. Because if there is interaction, it means that the outcome is complicated and we need to avoid saying foolish things about person or language that might not always be true. The second null hypothesis is that all the alphas are zero. 
There's no unusual rows. There's no effect due to factor one. Or in this experiment, there's no effect due to language. Language makes no difference to reading time. Language has no effect on reading time. And finally, every bit equals zero. There are no unusual columns in the table. In our experiment, that means person has no effect on reading time. So we have these three null hypotheses. And as I say, we must begin by testing the interaction null hypothesis. So the ANOVA table has all the usual headings that an ANOVA table has, but it will have three p-values, one each for factor one, factor two, and the interaction, which are denoted uh, under the source heading by language, person, and language star person, which denotes the interaction of language and person. Well, we must begin by exploring the p-value for language star person, the interaction p-value. The p-value for interaction in this case is 0, 0.000. That is less than 5%. Therefore, we reject the null hypothesis that there is no interaction between language and person in favour of the alternative. There is an interaction between language and person. And so because the interaction p-value is significant, we must explore the interaction and see what is happening in the experiment. It is not safe for us to proceed and interpret the other p-values in the usual way because of the interaction. If we did not find a significant interaction, then we could simply look at the other p-values for language and person and draw conclusions in the usual way. But because interaction is present, it means this is complicated and we must be careful with what we say. So we will explore this interaction and the simplest way to do that is by looking at an interaction plot. Here we have an interaction plot where the uh, horizontal axis represents the two languages and the key shows the different persons. So as we look at the plot, as we move from left to right with the plot, as we, as we look across the plot from left to right, we see what happens when the language switches from English to Spanish. So the red line, which is Manuel, when Manuel switches from English to Spanish, the reading time goes down. For Manuel, it's faster to read in Spanish. For both Alice and Samuel, when they switch from English to Spanish, the reading time goes up. So we see there's something very different happening when we switch between English and Spanish for the different persons. Now, this is a very striking example where the opposite happens. But for there to be interaction present, we don't need to have the opposite thing happen. It could happen that we have a situation like this where one person uh, reads a little slower in Spanish and some other people read a lot slower in Spanish. It could be that for all the persons, Spanish is slower than English, but for some, the amount of extra time required is greater than for others. That would still be an interaction. Interaction simply means that the outcome is not as expected. The effect of the combination is not the same as adding together the effects of the factors on their own. So while this uh, graph is very dramatic, we cannot be sure there's inter an interaction by looking at a graph. We know there's an interaction because the ANOVA table told us there was an interaction. The graph is simply used then to illustrate that. So you cannot tell looking at a graph whether interaction is present or not. You make that decision by looking at the ANOVA table and having found out that interaction is present, then the graph will illustrate that for you. In experiments, whether two-factor experiments or experiments of any other size, we need to choose an appropriate sample size, an appropriate number of replications. And in chapter five, we talk about sample size and power, and that applies to the testing of all null hypotheses, including the hypotheses that we test in experiments. So we use 80% power if we're doing research, that is, we're looking for a difference. And we use 95% power if we're doing validation, that is, we wish to establish equivalence. We want to prove that no difference exists. And so in section 5e of the textbook, we present the sample size and power approach. And that, of course, applies to experiments as well. One other thing to say about experiments, having discovered in an experiment that there's a factor level which provides some advantage, which, which provides a more favourable level for the response, more favourable average response. It's important to do confirmatory runs before 
implementing or announcing your discoveries. Because sometimes in an offline experiment, in a laboratory-based experiment, it may happen that an improvement in the process is seen, but it may not be possible to replicate that improvement in the actual setting of the process. So before you make an announcement that you've discovered uh, an improved version of the process, do some confirmatory runs under normal operating conditions to confirm that the improvements you've found aren't just improvements that are seen in the laboratory or in the experiment, but can actually be validated in real life. When you have found that there is one version of a process which is better than another, then the best way to make that change is to use a mistake-proof device. For example, in one of our experiments, we found that SUVs use more fuel than hatchbacks and saloons. So we would like all our employees to discontinue the use of SUVs. The best way to do that is to make it impossible, make it physically impossible for someone to drive an SUV. For example, we could erect a barrier at our entry gate so that an SUV will simply not fit under the barrier. That sounds dramatic, but we can use devices which make it impossible to do something the wrong way. And that's a good approach if it's possible. A three pin plug is a good example because the plug cannot be inserted the wrong way. Because of the shape of the pins, it's only possible to put it into the uh, power outlet socket the right way around. So a mistake proof device is a physical arrangement which makes it impossible for the inferior choice to be made. If it's not possible to use a mistake-proof device, then we can use audits. For example, we found in our football experiment that one player kicks the ball further than the other, others. Uh, if we want to make sure that that player takes the kicks at certain times, we can make sure that either we come along and check from time to time with maybe unannounced audits to make sure that that's happening, make sure that the advantage is being enjoyed by making sure that that level of the factor is the level that's been chosen. You can read more about this in the textbook in section 7b.